What's going on, Colts? Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Okay, good. I love the fact that you're on time. Nat Jones, what's going on? So it's 7 o'clock, and y'all know I like to start on time. So welcome to another episode of the Positive Impact Podcast, where we talk about all things relevant to the game that I love. Tonight's guest, we have one of Long Island's finest. I'm very excited about this episode tonight. Um, former skills trainer out here, former Orlando Magic assistant coach, now current Charlotte Hornets coach. Please welcome to the show, Jay Hernandez. There he is. What's going on? What's happening, Coach? Uh, you know, it's uh, like everybody else is trying to make the most of it, but I uh, appreciate this opportunity to talk to you. I've, uh, I really enjoyed the Kareem Reed, you know, podcast you had last time and, you know, hearing, you know, his journey and everything else. So th this has been fun to be, you know, to see and not now be a part of. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, I'll back up. It's waiting, it's waiting for you to connect. We can't see you just yet, Coach. We can hear you, but we can't see you just yet. Okay. Uh, I got I got you guys, so let me see. All right. I'm gonna see if I maybe I'll try to reconnect. All right, sounds good. All right. In the meantime, Ed, what's going on, baby? D's, what's happening? Terrell J. Turner. Is that tiny? All right, let me see if I can get Jay back on here. Hey, mama. There we go. All right, what's going on? Not much, man. Not much, man. I appreciate you uh, chiming in, man, and checking in on the show, man. We're trying to get this thing, this thing off the ground, man. It's exactly. going really, really well, man. So we're excited to have you for sure. I, I appreciate it. Yeah, I see, I see Eddie's on here. Uh, that I, I don't know who was on before, but I enjoyed the Kareem Reed podcast. That was, that was great to, to to see and uh, hear his journey. He was a monster. He is a monster, man. So yes, sir. Uh, to yes, see sir. Him. Uh, Steven Silas reached out to me today saying you guys went to prep school. So, yes. Uh, yeah, so he was just like, yeah, good good guy. You know, excited to see you on there. So uh, so really good stuff. Yeah, nah, no question about it, man. Well, let's jump into your story, man, because your your story is good, and I want I want people to hear your story. Yeah. Um. So, you know, you played ball on Long Island, played at St. Dimes, had a great high school career out here, man. Kind of take me back to the genesis of it all for you, how you – how you came up and and take me to St. Dimes with you. Yeah, for me, I mean, basketball has been a big part of my life. My father played 13 years in Puerto Rico, was on the national there. So uh, I still can remember him playing at, at the age of seven, you know, uh, going at it bad. And so, uh, you know, I grew up with a basketball. Uh, I was all over Long Island. Uh, I spent most of my life in Suffolk County as a kid. Um, over at Holbrook, I was in Quorum and Longwood Middle School, school district there for a minute. Um, ended up moving to Bayport, Long Island. Um, and then from Bayport, I commuted to St. Dominic in Oyster Bay, which is, which is a hike. Uh, so yeah. I that one out. Luckily for me, there was a teacher that lived, um, in, in, in the area and was able to bring me. So I, we'd have to get up super early, you know, take that five, five forty-five drive, you know, to, to Oyster Bay, you know, some late nights coming back from practices and stuff. But, um, you know, me, I just loved being on the island and hooping with everybody. I just remember 
Uh, for those guys like like you who remember the Lupus Classic that, that became big where Nassau and Stuffy used to compete over in Sayville. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Moore used to pick us up in a van. And, you know, I, I'd drive in with him. We'd go through Copeg, you know, Bayshore, Brentwood, pick up our guys, and then we'd go play at ISA or some of the tournaments, you know, in New York. And uh, that was my exposure to really competing and seeing, you know, basketball at a much higher level at a young age. And uh, when I got the Doms, it exposed me to a lot more, you know, like sophomore year. You know, having a chance to play against uh, Sham God, who's, you know, two years older at that point. I'm playing varsity. And, you know, my freshman year being able to see Felipe Lopez at St. Dominic. Like, we have both those teams come to, to Long Island and play us. Uh, every year we play Christ the King, you know, when they had Lamar and Speedy and Eric and Ira and all those guys. And, you know, we lost at the buzzer my junior year to, the, to them, you know, when they won it all. Uh, so every year we played, we played the best, you know, in the city. But then, you know, the, the Long Island – circuit right then you know was hopping there was just some really really good competition um you know like i said be because i was a suffolk county guy you know i used to play a lot of my pickup and knew all the guys you know, out in the hamptons like santa maritza's was where i used to go play a lot sable mm -hmm. used to have some great runs i used to go to dowling college with joe pelican and mike boyack and play against their college guys at the time you know yeah. and uh, all that stuff like sharpened me and made me so much better so when i got to the high school level you know, I had to pick up my, my speed, and, you know, I started to grow into my body a little bit. And, you know, fortunately for me, it was able to get a number of uh, scholarship offers, and um, it was all predicated on that main decision for me to, to go to St. Dom's and, and be able to expose myself to something different, you know, and then basically put, put myself in a very un uncomfortable situation. Uh, Help me, you know, down the line for sure. No question about it. So senior year, all Long Island. Player, player of the year, and you decide to go to the University of New Hampshire. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, played played there with my boy Carmen Marciello, you know, yeah. from FSCN. That's my guy. Yeah. Um, so talk about what it came down to you. Like, what were your two, what were your two final choices, and why did you choose um, UNH? I don't really remember what my final choices were at that time. Um, yeah. You know, I remember – it kind of happened very quickly for me because my junior year summer, I didn't really play much AAU coming up. Um, Long Island Lightning at that time was really brand new. Like that was, there was maybe, I was part of the first two teams that they had at that point yeah. in time. They, yeah. they, they all know that it's a big program now, mm -hmm. but um, you know, Jim Fox Jr. was my coach and he ended up, you know, becoming a head coach at the division one level coach at Davidson for a long time, but he was in college. He looked like a kid himself. Like a lot, a lot of times when we went, on the road, they wouldn't even let him sign us into the hotel, you know, that kind of thing. Right. Um, but I just, at that point in time, I played with some, like I said, the local stuff that I was doing with Mr. Moore, but uh, that was my first real exposure was like that junior year going to senior year. And I went to some big major tournaments and, and really, you know, got to work. Like I think, you know, all of a sudden schools that weren't really on me, you know, got, got on really, really quickly. And I had uh, probably over 20, 20, 25 mid majors that offered me, um, you know, we played at the, above the rim classic in San Diego, San Diego offered me, Davidson offered me, you know, and I had a couple of those and then I had a bunch of Eastern Seaboard, uh, Seaboard uh, schools and UNH was good for me because my family, you know, my girl who's now my wife, I figured they're going to see me play locally. You know, we played Hofstra, we played Hartford, BU, Northeastern, Drexel, Towson, you know, it's all, all games that everybody could go drive to. And so that was a big thing. I was like, you know, I'm going to go there right away, play. They had to build a new arena, you know, two years prior. They had a pretty, pretty good team. They had a couple guys that transferred from Boston College. And so I was like, all right, I'm, I'm going to give it a shot, you know, and uh, see what I can make work. Um, at the time, I wanted to go into hospitality management, and they had a really good program for that. Their business school was, was top notch. So I was, mm -hmm. I was thinking broader, you know, I was thinking basketball mm -hmm. plus you know, what I want to do for a living at that time, what, what I thought I wanted to do for a living. Right. Um, that was it, you know, it was cool because I, I did get to compete, you know, again, at a high level, got to start and get some great exposure, played against Hofstra at that time, you know, which was up and coming. They had a, a young coach and Jay Wright at that time and, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of local talent. Like, I, I just knew the guys that were there. I knew Tim Becker from Blue High, Stanley Martin, obviously Speedy committed, you know, Darius Burton was somebody I looked up to as a, as a point guard from Baldwin, mm -hmm. um, you know, so getting a chance to compete against those guys and being all rookie selection you know that year um was exciting and i was like i knew what what they were building because i had played with all those guys i was like these guys are gonna be legit the rest of the league wasn't taking them serious right. but i was I knew, I knew in my heart like what what was going what was going to happen and when i made the decision to back it was the best decision i made 
So now what made you, what made you, you know, you at UNH for one year, then you transferred to Hofstra. What made you come back to Hofstra? Yeah, like I said, for me, it was, I, I probably could have some choices, but I knew, you know, New Hampshire, this, the coaching staff there was great for me. Like Joe Jackson, like, you know, phenomenal. He wasn't the guy who recruited me there though. Mm -hmm. So when I got there, you know, just what I expected was different. You know, it was, a, it was more of a hockey school. They, they sold out for hockey games and it was crickets for basketball. So, you know, I kind of missed being home. I just really missed being in my backyard. And, you know, all of a sudden it's like, you know, Hofstra, who nobody was taking serious, you know, five years prior, they had legit ball players. you know. And I'm not I'm talking a lot of the top New York City talent was coming in. And that was, mm -hmm. that was, that was Jay's thing. It's like, we're going to win with New Yorkers. Like, you know, we're, we're, the Brooklyn contingent that we had come in was, was strong. You know, those guys, my man Norman Richardson and Roberto Giddens, you know, like came mm -hmm. in yeah. hot right off the presses, you know, and uh, when I saw mm -hmm. them, man, who are these two? You yeah. know, I had like Mark Petit come from New Utrecht and Danny Walker, and it just, it was, it was phenomenal. So, um, you know, just the young guys, Rick Apodaca as well from Jersey. So it was, it was just a great group of guys. And um, when I was coming back and playing pickup, I was like, I want to be part of this. Like, you know, I don't know how I'm going to fit in because originally, you know, obviously I'm, I'm, I'm on the smaller side. I'm, I'm pushing six foot. Speedy is the same way, you know, pushing six foot. And I didn't know at the time, but Jay was all about, I'm going to play my best five. Like, we, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, if we got three, five, five dudes out here and, you know, two, six, fives. Like, he was just like, we're going to play our best five and we're going to go compete. So I had a chance, you know, after that year to start and then, you know, go on a three-year, you know, binge with those guys. That was phenomenal. I mean, we won a lot of games. We, we got to a postseason and then two NCAA tournaments. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, just a lot, of, a lot of fun times with those guys for sure. So I believe, and then I also believe while you were in college, you had your first child. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I got married in college. I had my baby in, in college. And, um, you know, that's one thing I, that Jay, you know, Coach Wright always talks about. It's like, you know, I, I had so many things going on, you know, on my plate. You know, I was, I was trying to make money inside. I was doing, that's part of how training came to be. Because my father was the first trainer at Island Garden doing things. Yeah. I started doing stuff on the side. They, they had limitations on how much money we can make in college, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was just trying to figure out ways to make some cash. I was doing that. I was I was loading trucks uh, right off of Guy Brewer Boulevard with my dad's uh, transportation company that he was a part of and whatever it took. And, you know, I was going for my education, family life, and then trying to play at a super high level with those guys. I mean, we had two pros on the roster, and we were really trying to, trying to make a name for ourselves at that time. So, um, yeah, it was – a lot going on, but, you know, for me, I, I, I'm still the same way. It's like the more I have going on, the, the better I feel. You know, like, yeah, not a lot going on. I guess I start to get a little itchy. I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. Like, I need to be doing something. So, um, yeah, like my wife and, you know, I'll probably talk to her, I'll talk about her a bunch more times because, I mean, that's my rock. Like, we've been together from the beginning and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, just for her to be a part of the journey and like, my parents to be there, my in-laws to be there, like the support that I had around, you know, being back at Hofstra was, was phenomenal. Uh, now, it sounds like, it, and, and, you know, for a kid, you're a college kid, it shows a lot of maturity to handle all of that, you know, to be playing basketball. And most guys are just focused just on, on just that, just basketball. You know, you got to balance basketball, your academics, and you got to, you know, you got a family. So shout out to you for yeah, uh, persevering through that. You understand what I'm saying? So we got to yeah. show you love for that. Um, so three years at Hofstra, like you said, you kind of got um, you kind of got into the training piece while you were at while you were at Hofstra. You graduate with a degree. You get into pharmaceuticals. You know what I mean for a couple of years. You know because you got to put food on the table. You know what I mean yeah. you buy diapers and formula. So, but you knew you wanted to do this basketball thing. And um, you know what I think is you know what I think is great is you kind of you bet on yourself. Yeah. You know what I mean. You say you know what I. I, you know, I, I do what I got to do, but I, this is what I really want to do. And, you know, your wife's, you know, your, your, you know, your wife at that time supported that. And, you know, you, you made enough money to say, hey, listen, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to make this money overseas. We got enough money. To, we got enough money to hold us for a little while while I do this basketball thing. Talk yeah. about the pressure of that, because after six months, if this thing doesn't work out, you might be in a little bit of trouble. Yeah. Um yeah, so I was fortunate. I played in Puerto Rico for a few seasons, and I took uh, some time off. Uh, right after college, I, I got my dual MBA in marketing and management. So that was that was a blessing to be able to have that extra year. 
And while I was doing that, I was, I was traveling to Puerto Rico to play. And when I came back, actually, Hofstra offered me a job in admissions. So I was a uh, director of strategic planning, which is a fancy word for I don't know what I was doing, but it was it <laughs> making a little bit of money. And, you know, I was on campus still. So I felt good about it. I was like, all right, cool. I can do this. And uh, Chris Eldridge, who uh, played at Hofstra, um, his wife was a manager for pharmaceutical sales uh, company mm -hmm. in Johnson & Johnson. He's like, you should really look at this. I mean, they give you a car, they give you a gas card, you got benefits, uh, bonuses, you know, nice salary, the whole thing. So I looked into it and luckily, you know, I didn't realize how competitive it was to get into that, that, that space. But I got in, I did it for two years. Uh, they had awards like Rookie of the Year. I got Rookie of the Year, you know, in okay. uh, that territory. So I was doing my thing. Like, I felt pretty good. Like, I'm going to work this corporate ladder. I'm going to be making some really good money. Mm -hmm. But at that point in time, I was also figuring out a way to be on the court nonstop. Like, I was literally putting more hours doing basketball training than I was working my day. And so in the summer times, I wanted to run camps. You know, I wanted to be able to work with pro guys and not have any restrictions. I didn't know if my manager was going to come out on the road with me. You know, sometimes they, they would just, like, sneak up. They're, hey, I'm coming out with you tomorrow. You know, so there was some restrictions for me. And I was like, you know what? I, I want to be known for my basketball training. You know, player development wasn't even a term at that time. Mm -hmm. and, you know, so I had enough business and I knew I had some camps. I was like, all right, I can go back to Puerto Rico. I took three years off from playing. And mm -hmm. so I got myself in great shape. I went down there. I captained a team in, in a place called Calle and, you know, led. I was like top 10 in, in assists. I had a really good run. It was fun. And I came back and that was it. I didn't look back. I just figured in my mind, um, the people who take risks, right, uh, there's categories of it. There's some people that are just desperate. You know, they, they usually don't do well when they, they take those kinds of risks because it's out of desperation. Uh, there's people that are just dumb, you know, young, dumb, don't know better. They don't do any preparation. And right. they just take that real calculated risk and they have the talent to, to pull it off. And that's how I felt. I was like, I'm, I'm going into this in charge of training. There really wasn't anything going on. You know, there wasn't any, for me, any barriers to entry. I just had to figure out a place where I can just call home, which at that point in time was out in the garden. Mm -hmm. uh, I um there full time and i was good i got my insurance i did the website my marketing um you know i did i did everything i had to do you know to get it going and I finally got some trainers in i put the curriculum in place so everything i was doing at that point in time was like just bare bones you know just not not looking at anybody just saying this is how i'm going to do it based on my education based on my experiences and that was the, that was the best part about it because it, it started from scratch and we just had a great great group of people that ended up coming on the families that came and, and became a part of it was great. I, I can remember being at Island Garden and having AU tournaments and people not knowing what I was doing. They thought I was just shooting around with a kid. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would tell kids that they couldn't shoot there and then parents would want to fight me. You know, that was like the first thing I wanted, you know, like, I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, we're doing, we're doing a training where they're paying for this hour. You know, they didn't understand. Yeah. And then like most of the better players in New York had that same thing. It's like, I'm already nice. I don't need to pay for training. You know, that was the main, the mm -hmm. main thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, but shortly after, I was saying within a few years, you know, people saw the kids that I was training. They, they started to become really, really talented. They could, they could hold their own. There were kids that nobody was even looking for. And then mm -hmm. I started getting better and better players on the men's and women's side. And, you know, it was just about doing things the right way, you know, just finding the right people to, 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 to be a part of this with me. And, and we were able to build something pretty special. So I did that in 2004, and we ran it for 10 years. And the cool thing about it, and I say this is going to help me when – I become a head coach is the accountability was all on me. You know, that's the big thing. You know, people talk about responsibility. You know, to me, there's two different things. Like responsibility, you, 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 you have a responsibility to do things, but the ownership goes on somebody else. You know, that was, that was for me, that was a big thing. If my, I, I didn't have the gym, like my trainers were, were looking at me. Mm -hmm. I wasn't looking at them. You know, they, they were responsible to come to be at the gym, but if the gym wasn't accessible, that, that fell on me. That complete ownership. And so... Um, I learned a lot during that time. You know, uh, we were able to build some pretty big time events, do some non-charity work and uh, have some major sponsorship deals as well. So I was really proud of the time, you know, that, that we had there in Long Island for sure. No, nah, no question about it. So we're on here with assistant coach Charlotte Hornets, assistant coach Jay Hernandez. If you got any questions, um, put them in the um, put them in the question box for me. But I want to give a shout out to my Mattituck family. I see Bill Gildersleeve and his son William right. on there. Hey, that's my, yeah, that's my that's my yeah. family out there. So let's let's go back a little bit, Jay man, and let's talk about um, Wally Zerbiak. Yeah, who was probably you know who was your your first big name client and what that did for you. So talk about how that came about and how that got you rolling. 
the Wally and I, we, we grew up, you know, playing, you know, uh, with each other, um, just in like summer leagues and, and pickup runs over at St. Mary's High School. Um, there was uh, these brothers, the Leandas brothers, Greek brothers that, um, you know, opened up the gym, paid for it. And John Vlaginitis and his brother Jimmy, who uh, I know that became Division Three All-Americans, we used to run in, in this pickup run. And I was playing against grown men at the time, and while I was a year older. So we were just got, we just came up playing, and then you know, we started running that summer league for years, you know, together, mm-hmm. and uh, had a, just a great rapport. And he knew that I was doing training. He, you know, he knew that I was involved with it. And he asked while he, he got to the league, he was like, hey, can you put me through some of those workouts? I got to figure out how to get my shot off a little bit. You know, it, we were working on his handles, but it was more about his movements, how, how to set himself up to get a shot off quicker, how to create some separation and things like that. And, um, you know, he ended up becoming an NBA All-Star. Uh, we, we put a, um, a training DVD together, and it was awesome because, like, his mentality was like that I don't care mentality, which which I really appreciate. Like he he didn't care how he looked, as long as the end, end result was him, you know, getting that money that he got and being being able to win games. So um, even in the DVD, you know, for anybody who ever saw it or has it, I basically put him through the workout and we didn't edit anything. Right. You see every miss. You see him every time he traveled or something. I'd be like correcting him. Yeah. It was awesome. Like, you know, it was the most raw thing that you can get from an NBA guy because, you know, to be honest, all of us, you know, don't want to look dumb in, in the public's yeah. eye, you know, but right. it was like what it looks like. And, you know, I, I'll never forget the time that he came to the gym. And I, I love this story because it, it set the foundation for what we were about going forward. You know, he decided after he made a 65 million to come back and work out again. And he got the all-star appearance and he's like, Jay, I want to come work. And I was like, I said, wow, I got a girls clinic, right? That, you know, it's uh, going to be a whole trinity, three hours. I don't think I'm going to be able to do it tonight. Um, he's like, yeah, but are you going to be working on the concepts? I was like, yeah. He said, I'll come through. I, I had to have to tell him again, like, wow, it's a girls clinic, middle school, high school girls. He's like, no, nah, it's all, it's good. I, I'll be there. And I also got another call from Rich Slater, right? So he, Rich Slater, who I, you know, great job with the winners program, just retired. You know, tells me he has a girl that wants to come. And, you know, it's going to be a D1 prospect. The whole thing, she comes. I'm like, oh, look out for her. Within 10 minutes, she looks around, tells her dad, like, this isn't for me. Like, these girls aren't on my level and walks out. You know, five minutes later, Wally comes in, right, the 65 million dude in the NBA, and he's sitting in line. I wish I had camera footage of this, but he's yeah. sitting in line with, with my girls. Michelle Kurowski, I think, is on here right now, yeah. uh, who's one of our trainers, played at UMBC, killer. Um, her, Kate Barnowski. You know, they were all there, and they were like 5'3", five, 5'4", five, like 12 years old. And you got this 6'8", all-star in line waiting to do his little rip move or step back. And it was awesome. So, like, from then on, like, I didn't want to hear anything from anybody. Like, right. if you're going to complain and you're going to be in the gym, like, you need to go. Like, this is not what this is for. If you're in the gym, you're going to get better. Me and you are going to get this right. And, for sure. uh, you know, he set the foundation for us from that standpoint. You know, I didn't necessarily get, like, a ton of pros because of him. Mm-hmm. that time um that 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 kind of happened later mm-hmm. and i always tell a lot of young trainers like be patient like you know when you do things the right way it takes longer to succeed but it lasts longer when you do yes and so for me you know it got went from him then i was able to link up with jameer nelson and do a summer with him mm-hmm. kind of like sporadic between the pros that i was getting and then all of a sudden like the floodgates opened up i got in with a, a major agency um we had been producing some of our own guys you know, from the island, from from Queens, you know, from from uh, from the Bronx that were coming out consistently. And at one point in time, I mean, we, we had a killer crew. I mean, I was so amped to go to work every day. I mean, like you're talking like Cindy out of Gaines, you know, coming to the gym, Ben Gordon, you know, Kemba, uh, Tobias, Sylvan Landisburg, Truck Bryant. I mean, the list was crazy. And every day, like we were just sharpening each other up. And, and I'll never forget those times, man. Those guys made me a lot better because they came back every year from where they were being coached. Mm-hmm. And they all got better. They all learned more. Mm-hmm. So for me, I was like, I need to keep getting better in order to help these guys continue to grow. So they kept leveling, you know, make my level increase every single year as well. No, no question about it. So I think, you know, with, you know, I don't think that the story with Wiley gets enough, you know, gets enough, you know, um, enough publicity. Yeah. Probably the most, I would say the most publicity is when you started working with Kemba. Yeah. Um, so, Talk about the the rep your work mantra 
You know what I'm saying? You know, because that was that was always your thing. Anything that yeah. you put out, it was always like it was always about rep your work. And then talk about some of the unorthodox training methods that you were doing, like you know yeah. the the low dribble through the hurdles and everything. Kind of talk about how you develop your curriculum. Yeah, um, yeah. So like rep your work for me. You know, again, it was I, I had kids that were looking great in practice, but not always applying it in games. Mm -hmm. You know, so like, I, you know, you always get the feedback, like, you know, they, they went box and one or they started trapping and, you know, they just didn't do anything. Right. So, so I'm like, we're training you guys to be elite. Right. So like you're, you should be expecting this, this stuff from people and you should be trying the stuff that we're working on because that's, that's what it's designed for. It's not for you to be an average player. Mm -hmm. So like you need to start repping your work or this is it. Like I'm not wasting time. I'm not taking your parents' money. You know, um, I care about you, but you got to figure this thing out and, and start to, you know, show that confidence, you know, like it's time for you to apply your skills. And that's how it started. It was just, and then it started to catch, you know, like I started using it and, you know, I'm, I'm big on branding, you know, like you have to brand your, your, your message and, and what mm -hmm. you're about. Originally it was train like a pro, mm -hmm. you know, it was like, you know, pro hoops was all about train like a pro and all that stuff. And then, you know, rep your work just became like my handle and Twitter and everything else. And, uh, just the inspiration behind that, you know, like hearing people's stories, we're, we're now starting to take it to another level. My wife is and with her own page with Rep Your Work, uh, mm -hmm. hearing people's breakthrough moments and things like that. So mm -hmm. I love where, where that's gone, you know, and yeah. uh, um, what was the second question? I'm sorry. No, I, we was just we were just talking about the rep your work, the rep your work yeah. mantra, the rep your work mantra that was going on, but also your unorthodox style of training right. with your with your drills and stuff. Yeah, I don't know. Like some of that is just who I am. Like, you know, it's um, I have a creative way about me. I'm not I wouldn't say I'm artistic, mm -hmm. but I have a, a creative mind. Like, I, you know, I love getting with other artistic people, you know, people that do graffiti. Like we had a graffiti wall. Like I just love to interact with people that have that kind of mind that can put stuff to paper or, you know, music, whatever. So we always try to figure out like ways to make it creative for our players so that they stay in, stay engaged in the process. And then I was doing it with equipment that they could also go ahead and buy on their own or mm -hmm. have like makeshift versions of it at their home so that they mm -hmm. can do exactly what we were doing in the gym. It mm -hmm. wasn't like I was using, you know, $10,000 piece of equipment, you know, and, and relying on that for my training. You know, I was relying on like, this is stuff you can do on your own. And I expect you to do this on your own so that when we come back, we can advance the technique. And so some of it was just like by chance, like being a mad scientist, you're in the gym 12 hours straight and you see things that are happening, like maybe a kid makes a mistake and like, that's a variation. Mm -hmm. like we can, or I have a chair and I just happen just like to throw the ball through the chair. And I'm like, and then all of a sudden I see a hurdle. I'm like, what, what if I use the hurdle, you know, like the ball fit through there. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that stuff just started happening. And then I started figuring out like why I was using it and what the progression was going to be behind using it. And that was the most important part of it. So like the hurdle happened to me was all about the angles that you were, that you were hitting, you know, uh, got, they were able to do it and uh even if you got low you still know, hit the hurdle up so it was you had to have the right angle your, your fingertips had to be flat you know there's a whole bunch of stuff that went into it so uh i enjoyed that you know figuring out like some of the pool noodles you know 399 for a pool noodle cut it in half. i used that for visual distance you know like so that they understood i had so many players that struggled with the um with the distance that was needed to make a move in flow mm -hmm. you know it was like with a guy like you who could defend, you know, like if I'm coming up and I have I have the separation already, why would I, you know, like now have to force myself to create separation? Like if I have to maintain the separation, like how do you do that? You know, and then how do you have ability to do counter moves and, and be able to read and react, you know, those kinds of things. So a lot of it came through. The funny thing is I'm seeing it now because we're going to go back to the gym. It's going to be a one-to-one -one ratio again. It's going to be – me and one player like it used to be. There's, I'm not going to have two video guys out there and, you know, like all these things of people defending. Um, and we were talking about ways to be creative with a one-on-one -on -one scenario where you have to have to see the distance from these guys. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you read and react and how do you get them to, you know, have some cognitive, you know, uh, decision-making, you know, type stuff going on. And because of my time there, I was able to figure out, like, all these different ways to engage their brains with pattern work with calling out, you know, giving them three different things to think about at once and calling out one, and then that would be the move, mm -hmm. you know, by rolling out a basketball, uh, rolling out a med ball where they had to hit the ball coming off a pick and roll, you know, and they would get a point for that, you know, and the ball is rolling in different directions and it's tiny, 
you know, so they, they're working on their, on their pocket passes or, you know, mm -hmm. all those kinds of things. So some of the stuff that I had to do, you know, 15 years ago, you know, is now coming to fruition now. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm showing my young coaches and our development team, like, you know, these are ways that we can help them get better right now. You know, it's, it's, it's fun. So that, that's really what happened. You know, when you're spending 12 hours a day, you know, eventually try to figure out ways to be more efficient, ways to, you know, be more creative for your players. Uh, one of my favorite ones was putting a big cone on a, uh, on a scooter and, mm -hmm. you know, rolling them out at guys as they came off of like a, a chair for pick and roll. And now they had to read and react, you know, because as I'm rolling them, they're rolling in different ways. They had to, you know, sh 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 you know, kind of go through it like their, their opponents, you know. So a lot of that was just fun, you know. And I, I took a lot from, from the trainers that I worked with. We, we just vibed off of each other. It was like being in the studio. And just, you know, like, what do you got? What's the beat? You know, what's, what's, what's the technique going to be? Mm -hmm. All that. So, uh, just a lot of fun. Absolutely. So I think, you know, one of the other things that, you know, Kimba pointed out, and I think this is important because I'm kind of, I'm pretty critical of trainers these days um, as far as the development or, you know, are we doing things just for, for likes and, you know, and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty critical of what I see when it comes to skill development. I see a lot of, a lot of gimmicks out there, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but the one thing that I think was important that, you know, that Kimba said, and I think is important is that you actually played the game. So you're not out there actually just saying, okay, listen, go and dribble this ball underneath the hurdle. Yeah. I can actually demonstrate how to do it. Yeah and show you how to do it. So there has to be a respect level when you can not just blurt out the, you know, blurt out the instructions, but right. okay, now let me show you how I want you to do it. You know right. what I mean? So talk about obviously how like your, you know, you playing has helped your, you know, helped your skill development. I think it's helped me a lot. You know, it's um, for years I played ones with all of them. Every single person that came in, we played ones and mm -hmm. it was, you know, battles and, you know, I was so competitive, I, you know, defensively, you know, that was, that was my thing as well. When I was in college, I was defensive player of the year in the American East, my senior year. Like I took a lot of pride, you know, and Jay Wright, you couldn't play for him if you didn't defend. So, you know, I, I just would, you know, try to help people you know, with what I learned when I played against like Speedy, you know, how to change your line, you know, going up for your shot as opposed to always coming up the same way. Cause yeah. I'm, my hand is there, you know, so how, how are you going to change your line and still get a good clean shot off? And, right different things of being able to feel the body and stuff. So I felt it was really important to be able to, to do the one-on-one -on stuff but to have some fun and compete and see if what they've been working on is working against somebody, you know, in their 20s who played at a high level. And so uh, I definitely think it helps. Uh, I think sometimes some people just rely on the fact that they were ball players and they think, you know, I'm a trainer now, you know, and I'm, I'm just, just, you know, listen to me because I played, but they don't really know how to explain or teach somebody how to properly build a habit or what skill acquisition looks like. So I really tried my best to, you know, learn as much as I could about skill acquisition, you know, what the curriculum looked like, the, the, the when you would use a move, how, you, how you're doing the move, why you're doing the move, you know, and break it all down. And that's where the curriculum over years uh, was established. And it helped our players a lot because it, it got them to a point where they didn't have to think. They knew what their options were, mm -hmm. you know, and each player in their own right based on their position or – you know, their level of physicality, things like that, had their own specific go-to. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I just wanted players to, to know what they can go through when it got down to, you know, the last 10 seconds of the game. Like, hey, yeah. this thing, you know, like, people know Kemba's got the cross and the step back, but stop it. Mm -hmm. right? That's really what it comes down to. Yeah. And so we used to do a lot with that kind of stuff with our players, is, like, figure out what's your go-to. And that's that's going to be our one on one. Going to have to use those two to finish this game off with. One of yeah. those two get the bucket, or it doesn't count. Uh, if I'm playing against Kemba and I know it's cross step back or lethal, I'm going to do a two dribble limit, and I'm taking those two moves away, and he's picking my two moves to take away. He's taking away my between and my spin move. And now we got to figure out another way to get something done when an elite level defender who's been watching all the film, you know, maybe more athletic the whole nine, is put forcing you into. Uh, the help, like like Michael Jordan was saying right recently, mm -hmm. they were trying to force him to the help. So then, what do you go to? You know what I mean. And so, mm -hmm. like just trying to figure out those things with each player, uh, that was the fun part. So for me, it was a culmination. And obviously, the playing for me was great because some people learn by by seeing, mm -hmm. other people learn by by doing. You know, and so um, you know, trying to figure out where my players were on that spectrum helped me a lot in terms of designing the way I did things. Some players I had to throw everything to; others I could just explain it. Right. And they could they could pick it up and do it. Somebody to watch film with, 
uh, some players like now, you know, they might have a hard time on the board. So mm-hmm. what I do is I'll actually draw on the board the way Coach Borrego does and, and put a, a drill in place so that they can start visually seeing the way he would draw something. Mm-hmm. So that way they can pick it up and they can get more reps before the game even happens. So when an ATP happens, you know, they've already been in that in that realm where they can see how the board is, is happening and then they can go out and ex- execute. So uh, that's the fun part about it. I think you have to be able to really – combine everything nowadays there's so many good people out there no question about it man shout out to tobias harris who who chimed in on this man we're gonna try to get you on the show tobias look out for that dm please love to get suffolk county hey uh and tobias big time if he's still on here uh yeah. the stuff that he's doing in the community oh know, my god unbelievable um you know i just talked about it recently you know the guys that have been a part of, that i have been in their lives and they've been in mind just to see what kind of people they are um mm-hmm. Special, so you know, shout out to for, for what he's been doing. Absolutely. So let's fast forward to um 2014. Um, Jock Vaughn is taking over the Orlando Magic. You know, Tobias is in Orlando at the time, yeah. and, and um, you know, he's looking for a player development guy and, and gives you the call. Describe that moment when you got that call um, with the offer, and was it you know you have built up pro hoops you know for so long. Yeah. Was it tough for you to leave pro hoops and go take that job, or was it an easy decision for you? Nah, super tough. Um, like one of the toughest decisions I had to make, um, you know, because my wife is a tenured teacher in Long Island, which you know how hard that is to come by. And uh, my daughter was was playing; she was going to be a, a senior at St. Mary's. They were looking to win a state title, and so there was a lot going on, you know, from a family perspective. So that was that was difficult. It didn't happen as an offer right away. Originally, it was just like, let's all grab dinner. And I had dinner with him and, and Brett Gunning, who was my assistant at, at Hofstra, was an assistant at Orlando at the time. Um, and James Borrego was an assistant in Orlando. So we, we met in Brooklyn and had dinner, um, you know, and it was, it was great. We just talked basketball. And, you know, I could tell he was like picking my brain about like, you know, would you ever consider the NBA and why? Like, why would you leave now? And I told him I missed like the competing aspect of things. I missed mm-hmm. – the wins and losses that, that are attributed to coaching, just being a competitor. Mm-hmm. And basically it happened over a few months and we just stayed in contact. Eventually something opened up and he said, we'd like for you to consider this. You know, I came, I went, I went to, to Orlando, met with uh, Rob Hennigan him at the time, saw the operation. I just love the people that were there. And um, I, t- I talked to my wife again. It was just one of those instances where I said, I think I want to try this. You know, I think this is something that, that, could help us if it doesn't work out. Same thing. In my mind, I was like, I'm going to have that NBA next to my name when I come back to Pro Hoops. It'll be just an experience that I have where now 82 games, I, I know a pre draft is like on that side, you know, mm-hmm. I'll be on that side. And because the business was getting so competitive, in my mind, I said, that's going to be a separating factor as well because mm-hmm. I actually have that experience and the contacts I'll make as an entrepreneur in the NBA while I'm in the NBA is going to be crazy. That was, that was I was just that was really what I was thinking, and so I did that first year myself. It was the first year in like four months without traveling, so that was difficult in itself. I took a pay cut to do it because my business was running so so successfully, and people don't realize you don't come into the NBA making money. Uh, so I took a pay cut there, and then finally when I got my family to move, um, you know it got even worse because we lost money on my house and I lost the the salary that my wife was making. Right. I'm literally living paycheck to paycheck, like negative on Wednesday or Thursday, every every pay period in the NBA. But my, my mentality was just like, there's no glass ceiling. You know, if I can keep keep working, keep showing what I can do, I'm eventually going to get the money. I know I, I feel like I deserve the money I'm going to earn at some point in time. So, you know, it was it was a lot of struggles early. Uh, but fortunately for me, uh, from a basketball standpoint, it could have been any better. You know, we had obviously Tobias. Um, young guys like Aaron Gordon, Alfred Payton, Evan Fournier, Nick Vucevic, Victor Oladipo, uh, Mo Harkless. I mean, the list was was heavy. Um, you know, it's just so many good, good, talented guys there. And um, Ben Gordon was also there who I'd worked with. So right out the gate, I got two of the hardest working guys on the team, and Ben Gordon and Tobias Harris working with me. Mm-hmm. And that that got me comfortable with just the the training aspect of things. And then I had to learn the coaching aspect on the fly. It was a uh, got thrown into the fire, but, you know, uh, I wouldn't have changed it for anything. Nah, no doubt about it, man. So four years down in Orlando and then 
um, Coach Borrego, who's an assistant with you in Orlando, gets the he gets the um, the coaching job with the Hornets and and takes you with them. Yeah. Um, so obviously you had you had earned your stripes and once again bet on yourself and 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 won, you know, so yeah. you know, so to speak. So um, talk about you know talk about the move um, from Orlando to Charlotte and then the upgrading responsibilities. Yeah, I mean. Been a, there were a lot of coaching staff, you know, I had to keep learning under those coaching staff. So a big thing for me, my network grew pretty quickly. I was able to adapt and overcome and figure out a way to blend in with each staff and show what I could do. So I learned a lot in Orlando. Uh, when I had the opportunity to then go ahead to go to Charlotte, I felt like, okay, this is showing that it wasn't just Orlando that valued me because they got to see me work from the inside. But now it's like, okay, I can go to Charlotte. So for me, it was a matter of, reigniting, you know, that, 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 that flame in Charlotte, being able to reunite with uh, Kemba, with Jeremy Lamb, who I'd worked with pre-draft as well. Mm -hmm. And both of those guys for a while, uh, obviously being back with, with JB, uh, and Borrego, you know, it's a good opportunity to just grow and, you know, showcase what I could do for a whole nother management team, a whole new, new, new staff and, and new team that was in place. So but it was fun. It was a lot of fun. And, you know, now we have an offensive and defensive side of the ball. So I'm, I'm on the offensive side now. You know, with mm -hmm. Frank Vogel, I was doing both, but mostly responsible for the defensive side. I had 25-plus scouts of Frank. And, you know, now I get to, uh, you know, do offensive scouts where I'm watching the other team's defense, how we're going to attack it. And then I'm focusing on ATOs. Every game I, I'm going out there with my iPad and breaking down which, which ATOs might work at that time based on – are they switching one through five now? You know, off ball, what are they doing? Uh, who's the weak link in pick and roll? You know, I'd be able to watch all that stuff on the fly and be able to adapt what positions we put our guys in in certain instances as well. So it's been good to see the game on that side, and um, it's been fun. And being a director of overall player development, I get to do things the way I did a little bit with Matt Pro Hoops mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, collaborate with our sports science team, collaborate with our coaches, and and, it's, and obviously collaborate with our players because, you know, they, they have a lot of say in terms of, you know, how they're going to go about training, you know, who they train with in the offseason. Um, you know, we, we talk about, you know, some of the analytics that we see, some of the stuff that we're seeing on film. So I, I'm more at my disposable at this point, uh, at this time. But, um, you know, it's, it's still the same stuff at the end of the day. you got to be on the court. you got to be able to really put that work with those guys. And I, I think they appreciate it when you do. No, I'm definitely sure that they do. So – when you talk about the pre-draft, you know the pre-draft process, which Pro Hoops is 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 known for. Take us through, take us through the pre-draft process. Like, yeah. do you guys go out and select the people, or do the agents and or the agencies send guys to you guys? Take us through that um, from the beginning to draft night. Yeah, um, on the NBA side, right? Yep. Yeah. So on the NBA side, it's just we rely on our management team. You know, they handle all of that. They're dealing with all the agents. Um, you know, they watch players all the season. So they're getting all the intel overseas and in college in regards to, you know, who the player is, you know, how, how they operate off court. You know, I've, I've heard instances where they're talking to barbers, you know, they're talking to, you know, middle school teachers, you know, all those kinds of things. Just trying to get much intel and mm -hmm. information, you know, ex-girlfriends and, you know, they're, they're looking up your Instagrams and, you know, trying to figure out who you're friends with and commenting all the time, you know, all those kinds of things. Like, I'm sure that, you know, it's all out there now. So they're, they're getting information as they can about the person that's coming in because all those guys that are talented, right? It's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it comes down to what kind of fit, what kind of need you, you're looking for you know, your team. And so, uh, you know, we have players come in and we have our routines that we do with them just like every other team does. And, you know, we put them through, you know, different workouts and see them compete. And it's a good opportunity for us coaches who don't get to watch a lot of college basketball during the season because obviously we have 82 games. So we're traveling uh, to a city and we're playing so much that it's hard for us to keep up in terms of, you know, who's really good and who's not. And so um, it's all management based. They do a phenomenal job with how many games they see, um, you know, the information they, they get. And then, you know, we'll have our two cents in terms of like, we like the way this guy works or this guy looked pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it matches up to what they've seen the whole time. And sometimes it doesn't. So uh, part of that process is just to have them come in and, you know, get to see how they're taking instruction, how they vibe with, with coach. 
um, you know, basically, you know, what they're doing, you know, in, in and just get some more information about how they've been attacking the process. And I think that's it's important for you to get them in. That's why it's been hard these days where with this pandemic, we haven't been able to bring anybody in or see anybody, talk to them or get to know who they are. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's been a little bit difficult at this point in time. No question about it. No question about it. So as we begin to uh, wrap up this interview, I want to hit you with a few questions. So you trained a lot, a lot of athletes, pro, high school, over your over your course of your years. Let's let's go back into your let's go back into your history bank for 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 a few minutes. Give me three athletes that you would love to do a workout with. Three athletes. Yeah, like let's go through, or, you know, three ball players, and we can three. go back in the day, like you know what I mean. And let's talk about that. Give me three. <laughs> uh, if we're going back in the day, I got to go, Doctor J. Okay, Rough, Rough Riders. I would, I would love to see him, him training. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like that's stuff mm -hmm. that he did pioneered so much. So, yeah. uh, I would love to have that Long Island legend. You know, yeah. on the um, I would love to, to obviously Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. Right. Just if mm -hmm. I had the opportunity to, to get with Mike and, and you know, be able to do what I could do, you know, with him again would, would be phenomenal. And um I'm trying to think who else uh, I'll put on that list. I'm, I'm gonna throw one out. I'm gonna say Hakeem Olajuwon. Okay. Yeah, just okay. Uh, just in terms of footwork, a guy that can move the way he did. Um, mm -hmm. I think he added so much to the guards and the way they played. They watched how he did things, and all of a sudden you started seeing guards do the same things that he did. So I think I would like to work with all those guys just because of the respect factor because I know I could learn a lot from them, and I would love to see what I had that they would appreciate or what they would take, you know, and add to their. So I understand, we understand, you're a, you know, when you're a skill development guy or a player development guy, we understand the basketball piece, the on-court work, whatever the case may be. Talk to us about Mai Tai and how you bring that into it. Yeah, so it's a – well, it's a Mu Muay Thai is the, is the actual – Muay Thai, okay. Part. Yeah, it's, it's – um, yeah, for me, it's, it's more about the mentality. It's the fighter mentality. You know, there's the, – if you're in the ring, there's the, – you can't, you can't get out of control. You can't get uh, too angry. You know, mm -hmm. um, you have to stay focused. Your level of engagement is there every second or you could get hurt, you know. So I, I try to bring that aspect to the way our guys are training. We did it with our pre drift guys when they were a part of it. And we took them to the gym so that they can feel and sense and see that look. Because when you're in pre-draft, you're going head-to-head -head with somebody else. So, like, for me, I was like, all right, we're going to go ahead against Tim Grover and Attack Athletics or IMG Academy or this one. Like, we're going one-on-one -on -one for a million dollars. Like, let's get it. You know, it's, a, it's that same mentality for the first time in a long time where it's a team sport. And you're, obviously guys are their leading scorers and they do things for their teams, but they're still a part of the team. In this instance, it's just like, who are you, right? Like, who are you as a player? And you're going to match up against this phenomenal player who we're also thinking about for the lottery and who's going to win that battle. So, um, you know, for me, I started doing it as cross-training when I, when I was playing. I started doing it um, to get in shape when I was done playing and I missed the competitive uh, part of it. Started sparring and then it became a little bit more serious. I, I took three fights on, uh, two in the Bronx. I did one at um, uh, War Resorts Casino in Queens. And uh, it was a great experience. It's one of the things that my guys love to talk about. They love to, to, to slap box with me and, and have fun with it. Um, but, you know, just, just having that, that, that mentality and that toughness behind it, uh, I think a lot, of, a lot of people resonate with that. Now, did you get like? Did you get any looks from the guys? Like, you got us doing what? And like, what does this have to do with my game? Or was there just a an unbelievable trust that you had, and they didn't they didn't question it? Yeah, no, they had a lot of trust. I mean, they were they asked the question, like, am I going to get kicked over this? And yeah. I wasn't going to happen to them. Yeah. Uh, but the training itself was intense. It was very mm -hmm. cardio based. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of a lot of kicking, a lot of knees. You know, you're using your elbows and punches. Um, so it, it works your core for me. The mobility uh, behind a lot of the movements mirrored what we did in basketball. So, you know, like a spinning back fist is no different than, than a spin move that you would do in a game. Right. So a lot of the stuff started translating for, for those guys. And it was just another way to mix things up because we were together six days a week for months. Yeah. And so yeah. we, it was just a, another avenue for these guys. And 
they all loved it. You know, anytime you feel like you're you're learning how to fight and protect yourself as well as condition yourself, like you know, they they, they want to take pictures. I took them to a fight. I got the uh, militia fight academy at the time over in Valley Stream. Uh, shout out to crew Bob Perez. I mean, uh, uh, not Bob Perez. Uh, uh, crew Tyrone out there, and um, you know, uh, my guy Cyrus Washington fought that night. So they got to see a world-renowned Muay Thai specialist go go in the ring and. They, they just they, they took that level of appreciation up so crazy. So it was awesome, you know, to be a part of. They trusted the process and, you know, had anybody had any reservations, we would have figured something else out for them, you know. But I, I really wanted them to be a part of it. And uh, the year before, I didn't have the guys doing as much of the training, but they did see me in a, in a fight. And so they came out and they saw what I put my body through. I lost 40 pounds. You know, they saw the, the level of commitment. So I think for them to see a guy in, the, in his 30s at that point in time, you know, get to that point um and they were they were fighting i was i was fighting for free and they were about to go money that they've been working out you know their whole lives uh, yeah they knew it was time they, they didn't they didn't have to question much absolutely absolutely yeah. so you want to be a head coach one day okay so i'm putting you i'm giving you the job as the head coach you got the yeah. head coach job give me five all-time coaches that you got to have on the bench with you <laughs> I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start. With, I'm gonna start with college uh, because I think nowadays what's happening is there's a lot more zones, a lot more presses. You know, the, the game is changing from that standpoint, and what we can do defensively as well. So, I'm going Jay Wright. I gotta go with my guy first, number one. Um, just he's a Hall of Famer. <laughs> he's won two titles. Mm -hmm. He's coaching with Team USA. Like he he knows. You know, he's a guy that I could trust. We already have a communication collaboration. Uh, I'm going to go with Dawn Staley. I'm going to okay. go with a player who's, you know, game I respected, you know, had a shoe deal. Yeah. Won a national title as well. I just, I love what she brings to the table from a commitment standpoint, work mm -hmm. ethic. I love her style of play. So I would have to have Dawn staff. Um, past and present, I'd probably go with a former player, uh, Bill Russell. Okay. I would, bring, I would bring Bill Russell in because he has the head coaching experience. Um, he's got 11 rings. I mean, there's not much to, to debate there. I mean, there's nobody else has been able, been able to win a ring being a coach and a player at the same time. Mm -hmm. So the level we're going to have for, for Bill Russell, he has to be on there. You always have to have a former player in the mix. Um, man, it, it gets tough after that. Uh, probably Phil Jackson. Okay. Yeah, I probably have to go Phil Jackson. Obviously, what he was able to do um, – you know, just all the reports of, you know, Michael Jordan, who to me is the best of all time, saying, like, the way Phil handled stuff off court and the way he was able to tell that team and the way he came in and said, you're not going to lead us or lead the league in scoring anymore, mm -hmm. you know, for in order for us to win a championship. And, you know, they, they had their little bouts early, but, you know, to have that, that command over, you know, players like that, to me, I would want to really pick his brain, you know, from a coaching perspective. Absolutely. Um Man, uh, last one, just because I know a lot of guys that work for him, I would say Popovich. Yeah. Uh, you know, a, a lot of the guys that I work for, starting off with Jock, James Borrego now, Chad Force here, uh, just to name a few guys. Um, you know, I think they learned so much, the level of respect they have for him, you know, the five rings, uh, the way he's done things, I think you can't beat it now. You know, what he's doing with Team USA, you know, and – I just think he'd be a great guy to, to learn from. I think he's got a great feel for uh, connecting with people and, and off-court stuff that he sets up in terms of the dinners and things like that. So mm -hmm. a lot of stuff that everybody's doing around the league, they're just copying what, what he did. And, and the guys that are winning at a very high level right now, you look across the league, he's touched most most of the guys that are head coaches right now in some, some fashion. So, uh, you know, so I, I would probably go that route. But – not an easy one to put together that list for sure. There's, there's been so many, so many talents, but I would, I would definitely mix in some college because of where we're going with the, with the game. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of those guys for reasons I talked about. Nah, I love it. I love it, man. Well, I appreciate you coming on here with me. I was really excited to talk to you tonight, man, and your journey. And like I said, I love your story, man. I love the whole rep your work uh, yeah. mantra. You know, I'm, I'm following the page on Twitter right now. So I'm, awesome. I'm doing my research. I'm doing my research on that, man. So I definitely appreciate you coming on here and um, and showing us love, man. No, without a doubt. Like I said, I appreciate what you're doing and saw some great people, you know, 
fun here, Nate and uh, Speedy. Uh, you know, just a lot, a lot of good basketball, basketball heads. I, I recognize a lot of the names on here. So, uh, you know, obviously this is going to only continue to get bigger and better. And hopefully I can be back on when, when someday when I, when I, you know, elevate myself. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. And hopefully your family is um, safe during this time down there. Yeah, man. Everybody, everybody we're, we're together. Yes. I, I love my family, but uh, I also like them, you know, so we, we were enjoying our time together. Yeah. A lot of our families in, in New York. So we're, we're, we're missing them right now. That's the one one thing we wish we could we could be with them. So later we're gonna try to figure out a way to get back to back to Long Island and see everybody. No doubt, man. No doubt, man. Well, I appreciate you, man. Be yeah. safe, man. And God I bless you. All the best.